feet and daylight unto my path. Unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and daylight unto a light unto my path. Welcome to Searchlight, a survey through Scripture with Pastor John Corson. It is our desire to bring you a systematic study of the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, book by book. What if you lived in a perfect world, a world in which the environment was perfect and the government was perfect? Everyone had as much as they needed of everything, and there was no danger to anyone. Wouldn't that be great? Well, you'd think so, but it won't necessarily play out that way. In our last program, Pastor John was describing for us the millennium, that perfect thousand-year period that is coming, where Jesus rules and reigns on the earth. Toward the end of this thousand years, Satan will be released, and many people will choose to follow him and turn their back on the perfection offered by God. On today's program, John will conclude this teaching with a warning that this same kind of attitude can creep into the kingdom of our own hearts. Let's now join John and see how we can keep focused on God and the perfection that he offers. Sometimes... We that grew up in Christian homes or you that have walked with the Lord for a while, we can start to say, oh, yeah, righteousness with God, peace from God, the joy of God. Oh, yeah. I want to go to rock and rodeo. I want a tattoo. I want what... What happens? What happens? Let me tell you. Please turn with me to the second to the last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah. Zechariah, chapter 14, and I'll tell you what is going to happen in the millennium and what is happening perhaps sometimes to you, sometimes to me. Zechariah, chapter 14. Talking about these events, the whole thing is dealing with his coming. Verse 4 of Zechariah 14. Jesus' feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem. The mount shall cleave in two. We've talked about that. Oh, in that day, it shall be light. In that day, there shall be, verse 8, living waters that will go forth from Jerusalem. In that day, verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord, and his name one. Oh, my. In that day, verse 11, men shall dwell in Jerusalem. There shall be no more destruction. Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Can you believe that? Jerusalem, safely inhabited. But then he goes on to say, and note this. Listen carefully. Don't miss this. Because here's what God says about that day, the kingdom, and how it relates to this day in your life presently. It shall come to pass, verse 16, that everyone that is left of all nations which came against Jerusalem, all the survivors of the tribulation, all those that are now in the kingdom. It says, They shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That seven or eight day celebration given in the Old Testament law in which people would go to Jerusalem and they'd have a great big gigantic Jesus Northwest. That is, they would camp out to remember we were in the wilderness for 40 years. Yet God protected us, provided for us, took care of us. Man, he was good. And now they camp out, and they celebrate, and they dance, and they sing, and they sacrifice in honor of what the Lord did in seeing them through those difficult days, those dry deserts. The Lord says, in the millennium, I want that reenacted. I want nations, peoples, families from all over to come to Jerusalem to celebrate how I brought them through the 40 years or 80 years of their dry existence previously and brought them into this fullness, this abundance, this provision, you see. Mm -hmm. It shall be, verse 17, that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth 
to worship the king. You don't have to come. You're invited to come. But if you don't want to come, you don't have to. But whoever does not come up, the Lord of hosts, to worship him, well, even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. So God is saying, in this millennial celebration, you don't have to come to Jerusalem. If you've got better things to do, you don't have to come. But know this, there's going to be no rain in your land. You're going to get real dry. That fig tree and that vine that I provided for you, it's going to become dry to you. And your children, your family is going to be plagued. You don't have to come. But if you don't come, know this. You're going to be dry, and you're going to be plagued with problems that you wouldn't have otherwise. I want you to come, the Lord is saying, annually. I want you to come regularly. I want you to come consistently. I want you to come as I'm inviting you to come to Jerusalem. The temple, you see, in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt by the Lord in the millennium. The Antichrist's tribulation temple wiped away. Jesus Christ, when he comes to the city, will build a new temple. It's huge. It's described in Ezekiel. Four of the Old Testament prophets talk about what's going to take place. There's going to be sacrifices in the temple. The people of the world will go to Jerusalem, Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, other times during the year, and they will see sacrifices. They'll see the priests slitting the throats of lambs and bulls and goats, blood flowing. Why? Because, because all these generations in the millennium who never saw crime and sin and sickness, mom and dad get to take them by the hand. Grandpa and grandma, great grandpa and grandma, great great grandpa and grandma, great 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 grandpa and grandma, great 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 grandpa and grandma, great 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 grandpa and grandma. Remember, you're to be a thousand years. They'll take their family and they'll say, Junior, Junior, honey, see that? That's what sin does. You don't know about this because you've grown up in this glorious kingdom that our Yeshua, our Jesus, is, is ruling over. But you've got to understand that sin, it kills. That that, that that one who's sitting on the throne there in the city, Jesus, Yeshua, He was slaughtered like that lamb. His hands became like claws when the nails were driven through his wrists. It would cause the hand to turn into a claw pointing towards his body. Blood would flow from his body as it was whipped. His his kidneys would be exposed on his back. You could see his lungs. That's what a flagellum would do. The whipping on his back that he went through. The one honey that sat on the throne had his insides exposed. His, His skull was three times bigger than normal because six inch Thorns pierced his skull, and the bloating and the swelling would cause it to be repugnant, abnormal. And there would be a spike through his heel, just just like in Genesis 3, verse 15, the first time the gospel is mentioned that Satan would smite him and that he would have his heel bruised. So too a spike went through his heels and bruised him, and he hung there. And that's that's what sin does. He who knew no sin, the one who sits on the throne today who knew no sin, became sin. He took, that's what sin does, Junior. That's what sin does, honey. That's what, you want to know what sin does? It makes you ugly. No matter how you comb your hair and perfume your body, no matter how stylish you might dress, you're ugly. It's hideous. Sin, no matter how you polish it off or dress it up, the fact of the matter is it's gross. It's abnormal, it's ugly, it's painful, it's brutal. Sin stinks. That's why we had to come here to the temple. You have to understand, because you haven't seen this, because you've lived here in the kingdom for 500 years, but you've got to see what sin does. Look at that little lamb. Watch that goat. See it slaughtered. See it burnt. See it fried. See it wreathed. See it die. That's what sin does, and that's what... This one man that we come to worship did for you. He who knew no sin became ugliness, your ugliness, he took on himself. And you got to see that. And Junior and Sweetie's eyes may get a little bit moist. I don't like to see lambs slaughtered. I don't like to see cows killed. I don't like to see goats gored. But you got to understand 
And the temple worship will be an illustration, will be a picture, will be a poignant, powerful portrait of what sin does and what our Savior did. But some are going to say, I don't, I don't want to go. I've already seen a slaughter or two of a lamb there in Jerusalem. I've already seen a, a goat sacrificed or a bull killed. I've already seen that for 500 years. Why do I need to go? I, I've been around. I, I don't need to do that anymore. And guess what? They won't go. And God says they won't go. And their house is going to be plagued with problems. And there's going to be dryness. And here's what I want to say. We live in the kingdom today. We live in the kingdom today. And the Lord spoke to my heart last night as I was pondering this. You know, you know when God speaks to your heart. You know that. I mean, you know when God speaks to you. You just know it. It's just, just there. And I couldn't help but go, awesome, Lord. Because I've been saved for a long time, ever since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I've been around Christian stuff all my life. A lot of folks in the fellowship are now getting some years under their belts too as far as their walk with the Lord, and here's the danger for them as well. I've been there. I've seen that. I don't need to go. I sat there and was so blessed to hear Brett Metter teach yesterday morning. He talked about how we see through a glass darkly. We had a big men's meeting at the Reston there and town, a bunch of brothers got together, worshipped the Lord, heard Brett share. And I was just really blessed. And then what really got me, though, was when it was done, great big guy in the fellowship here, a lot of you know him, Clovis, he's a truck driver. Big guy, man's man. Black t-shirts he wears, you know, big mane of hair. Came up to where I was sitting and he put his head on my shoulders. This is a big guy. And he had tears that were just rolling down his eyes. He says, I'm so blessed. I said, what's going on? He says, man, he says, I'm so, God has done such a work in my life, I can't believe it. He said, I'm teaching a home Bible study now. And who would have thought this, where I come from, what I used to do, where I was at? And he just started bawling. He was just, just in ecstasy about what God had done in his life. And I found my own eyes getting a little bit moist just listening to Clovis. He kept his head on my shoulder. <laughs> what a tender guy, man. And then I grabbed Benny, and we went from the breakfast over to Bymart, and there was a guy named Joe who was at the breakfast, and he was there at Bymart, and he saw me, John! So he began to share a bit of his story with me. He's a Rough living guy before the Lord got a hold of him. Big guy. It's kind of big guy's day, I think, or something. I don't know. But he, he'd been around the block a few times. And he was sharing how God had grabbed his heart and how God had touched him there at the breakfast and what God is doing in his life right now and stuff that's taken place and how he just used to be so stubborn and rebellious and how God has got it and how free he is. And he started getting moist in the eyes and found myself, same thing, and Benny kind of looks at me, watching these things unfold. And I thought, you know, I could have missed it by not going to the temple. I could have said, well, you know, I know what Brett's going to say. I taught him. Uh, (laughs) I don't need to go. It's Saturday. I'll be at church tomorrow. Uh, You know, I've got my lawn to mow. Uh, It's the final four. Uh, You know, why should I come? I've been around this stuff. I I know 1 Corinthians 13. We see through a glass darkly. I've preached bunches of sermons on it. you You know, and I could have not went to the temple. What temple? Paul says, what? Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Who? The body of Christ. Peter says, you are living stones being what? Fit together. You're living stones. I could have stayed home and watched Stanford lose and been depressed. I wanted Stanford to win. But instead, I found myself 
blessed, really ble- living stones, a great big stone, a great big rock of a guy, Clovis and Joe and others. Living stones being fit together. I need that. I need to go to the temple. I'm thankful that I can go. I'm thankful for Jeff and the brothers putting that breakfast on like they did. I'm thankful that I could go. I'm thankful that I can sit here on Friday nights right in this back corner. Because, see, I need to go to the temple and I need to offer the sacrifice of praise. Why? I I need to come here with you guys. I need to sing. I need to sacrifice praise. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good. He's good to me. And I forget that. Can you believe it? I've been around it all my life. I get used to it. And I can start to say, well, of course God's good. I know that. But when I come here, you see, when I'm with saints, when I'm at the temple, when I make the effort to journey to the place where, where, where temple activity is happening, yes, you are good. And there's nothing like a Friday night when you're just doing nothing but saying, God, you are awesome, or coming in in the morning hours for communion. I need communion. The lamb that's slit, the goat that's gored, the bull that's butchered. I hold that cup in my hand, and I realize I need to be reminded of this, not quarterly, Not semi-annually, not ritualistically. I need this constantly. Lord, I need to be reminded of what you did for me, that you were slaughtered. That my sin is forgiven and how ugly sin will be if I let it continue on in my life. I need to see how bloody it is, what breaking takes place because of sin. I need this, Lord. I need, I need, I need this. I know it here, but I need to have it here. I need to go to the temple. And all I want to say today is simply this. After all that, all I want to say is I'm really thankful for the church. I'm thankful for this fellowship. I'm thankful for the body of Christ. Because, you see, I could be like those in the millennium who just live in the kingdom and say, oh, well, we don't need to go. And there would be a drought in my heart and a plague on my family. I don't have to go. I get to. And what a place he's provided for me. I'm real thankful for the church, for this church. I'm thankful that I can handle the body and the blood and be reminded of what sin does and what he provided to sing songs of praise, to be built with living stones like you guys. And can I give you this final thought? If you grew up in a Christian home or if you've been a Christian for a long time, please be on guard against the millennium mentality that takes place in these people when they say, eh, we're in the kingdom, everything's hunky-dory, meh. Optional, eh, no big deal. They end up, sad to say, in the pit. A rebellion. Oh, I'm sure if you asked them in the year 500 of the millennium, are you going to rebel against God? They would say, no way. But something happens. Strife, contention, and pretty soon snares, and then from the pit, and then, yeah, sounds good. And they're wiped out. I don't want that to happen to me. I need to be at the temple. I need to be in the place where I am being renewed. And I'm real thankful for you and for this church, for the opportunity that God has given us, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Value it. Esteem it. In fact, can I give you a profound quote? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things, they'll fall into place. But seek first the kingdom in everything you do, and everything else will be taken care of for you, guarantee. Seek first His kingdom. 
It sounds so simple that we often ignore it. But if we do, we will likely develop a millennium mentality. Today, let's go up to the temple. That is, let's continually offer the sacrifice of praise for what God has done for us. It's the key to maintaining a vibrant walk with the Lord. If you would like to have this complete teaching, you may order one from our website at johncorson.com. You may also call us toll-free at 888-544-4858 and ask for the teaching from today's date. Again, that ordering number is 888-544-4858. You will also find on our website a variety of Pastor John's books, teaching packets, MP3 CDs, and other Bible study resources. Again, the address of the website is johncorson.com. Searchlight is a listener-supported ministry. We appreciate your prayers and support. May the Lord richly bless you.